Good evening, people. I'm Rick Dumont, Sweaty Turtle Entertainment, the producer of the show, and also now another night tonight, Roving Reporter. And we are in Nashua at Chunky's for the premiere of the trailer of the acclaimed film Spin the Plate, which was based on the acclaimed novel of the same title. And right now I'm bringing in Eric Eastman, who was the director of the film. Come on in, Eric. Good to see you. We How are you? We can do better than that. <laughs> yeah, we can. Good to see you, Rick. How you been, man? Terrific. Excellent. Terrific. Excellent. So... We're not going to take up a whole feel, lot of your time because I know you're going crazy tonight. No, feel free. But. Walk right on through. Ah, so courteous. Yeah. Isn't that um, nice? tell, tell, tell us a little bit about this film and, and what happened in your directorial role, and I'll get... Well, goodness gracious, this film is, as, as you've m very astutely mentioned, uh, predicated on um, the events in a novel by the same name, mm -hmm. written, coincidentally, by the wife of the guy that wrote the screenplay. And they're New Hampshire people. Yeah, well, they, they had been at, at one time. It's okay, we're doing this in the middle of a highway and <laughs> sound engineering being what it is. Uh, there's a there's a indoor skydiving center just on the other side of this wall. So. And, and the people look very funny as they're falling or not falling. Yeah, they certainly do. I, I intend to pull a James Bond later and, you know, with the lips flapping. There you yeah, go. Yeah, That'll yeah. be fun. Uh, so that's what they did. They got together and they did this. And initially, again, it was just going to be a novel. Feel free to walk right on through, right people. Ahead. Don't right. have to stoop. Please don't ingratiate yourselves. We're all people here. And uh, uh, Donna uh, Anastasi wrote the novel, as I say. And uh, both of them actually are prolific writers, both uh, uh, wonderfully intellectually gifted people, big hearts, uh, wonderful married couple. They got a couple beautiful young ladies. Um, and she wrote this novel, I'm going to say roughly six, five years ago. And it didn't take long for it to begin opening some eyes. In yeah, the I was say, wasn't category. it like a bestseller in New York Times or uh, it, won some award or something? I don't know if it earned that particular distinction, but it won several. It won quite a lot. Right in front. No, right in front, please. Yeah, you can cross right in front of us. It's all good. We've got some electronics back there. This is better. Uh, you're fine. Yeah, feel free. You're fine. Bring it right on through. So I appreciate she your courtesy, but don't worry about it. Yeah. She wrote the book. It really uh, turned some heads in the women's literature category because it was a very raw, honest, and uh, visceral treatment of, uh, of the kind of story that you hear a lot about, but people don't have the courage oftentimes to write about it or shoot a story like this with that kind of honesty. Well, I know, I know in talking with our specialist corner, um, man, Mark Resnick, who happened to be in the film. That's he, right. He played a pretty, uh, challenging, pretty role. challenging role. And I know from my perspective, having written several screenplays that are, one would call vile, and, and, and has that kind of very, very rough story, poignant story points to him. Yep. Um, how, is, how is he to work with, first of all? Let's, let's get, get to Mark and a little, give me a little juice on his uh, taking direction. Sure. No, Mark's my man. Mark's my man. He... Uh, he comes from the same school, artistic school of thought, I think, that I do. We're, generationally, we're very similar. Our, our, um, our, our pop, pop cultural influences, both music during our days of our youth and all that, are also very similar. So we're coming from a similar place. And so we, we, we became fast friends pretty quickly. Oh, it's pretty you know, easy to become like friends with Mark. Mark. Mark is phenomenal. So. We, we kind of, we're artistically inclined and, 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 you know, we, we did good work. So he was great to work with. I, I like his fondness. Um, and by the way, this gentleman that we're speaking about right now, Mark Resnick, um, played a, a supporting lead role, and he also played the primary antagonist in this story. So it was a very challenging role because the antagonist in this story, you know, basically gets caught, found out having done some pretty, uh, pretty unforgivable things, um, you know, that has to do with child abuse and all that kind of thing. And it's unfortunate uh, that, that, that the story has a character like that, but it's important that it does, because it's a story that needs to be told. So what he did with the role, and this is what I was, what I was driving at, is that he injected 
a degree of humanity that I did not foresee for this character. Well, he, he has a depth that, that, that not a lot of people he's have. Earned he's earned it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. God, yes. Uh, but the question I have for you, when you're, when you're talking about directing that kind of character and an actor in that situation, what, what goes through the head and, and how do you... How do you get past the fact that you're so disgusted by what's about to ha what's going to be, what the storyline is, but then you need to actually get it down on film? And how, do you, how do you reconcile that and cross those paths? The way you reconcile it is the way that anybody reconciles it. And, and speak of the angel herself, the very author ah. of Spin the Plate is walking right on through our frame. We'll be, we'll be getting to her. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be getting to you in a second, Donna. We'll see you, Donna. <laughs> Uh, what goes through, uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll give her the option. What goes through my head as a director is, especially when you're dealing with a story that entails so much emotional and spiritual damage, is the fact that uh, when people withstand these events in their lives and everybody has a story to tell, everybody's carrying something, everybody's, everybody's got their challenges, is the fact that life goes on. It just goes on. So you've got to tell it truthfully, and you've got to let people deal with however they deal with their damage, sure. and also deal with the way that they grow out of it and grow into something better. But you, you have to give every one of them, every actor, enough rope not to hang themselves. So I, don't want to, I didn't want to rely on that cliche, but enough rope it's a good class song. to take ownership of this character to the extent that the character advises them on how that character is going to get on with it. Get on with the business of living and hopefully living well. So your actors are responsible to do that and that's one thing I kept imparting to them is that I may have my vision but this is like uh, the opposite of peeling an onion. We're building something and you have the writer, that's their vision and uh, it coalesces and the story gets told and you get the screenwriter who needs to adapt it to a new medium then you've got the director, in this case that's me, and then you've got your cast, and ultimately your editor and all that. So, but this vision keeps growing, and it should keep growing. So it's that process that we have to undergo that I advise the actors on, that this was their journey. And an interesting one. I mean, I can't wait to see the film myself. I'm either. really looking forward to it. <laughs> I, wish, I wish Donna didn't uh, walk away, because I, I want to have the two of you together talking oh, about how... Yeah. Her vision of the, uh, from her vision of the story, what? Okay. You're going to go get her. Well, I have to say... <laughs> but I have from to from say a director's standpoint, how many films, just so the audience knows sure. your history and, and experience, how, you know, in, in terms of uh, directorial experience and, and acting and all that, how long have you been, you've been at this? Since I was 16. I'm 52. Long time. So a lot of films under your belt. Yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. No wonder you're Primar so good. Primarily as an actor, thank you very much. But I mean, just I feel like I'm just getting started. I understand. You know what I mean? Yep. Oh yeah. Because every new oh, yeah. character brings a whole new set of challenges, and obviously I bring my half a century worth of perspective, mm -hmm. and world view, and values to bear on every character that I craft, that I'm asked to craft. Sure. So I'm going to do it differently now than I did when I was 30. It's Hopefully. That's that's better. You know, <laughs> we're just we're just differently. Differently, but yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's it's. The idea of, of learning as you go and taking little tidbits and piling it onto yeah. your, your repertoire and improving you know, the hurdles that you hit when you're making a project. I mean, how long did this take to shoot? Because it's a full feature. All right? last, pretty much the bulk of last calendar year, mm -hmm. 2014. It's now summer 2015. We had hoped ambitiously and even a little bit projected ambitiously Aren't that, we all? that yeah right <laughs> that, that we would have finished post production but you know post production is uh, I don't know it's like being in a kitchen with some of the finest chefs ever yeah. and some things just taste better when you cook them in a crock pot which takes time my, see my wife describes my like the whole post editing process as circumcising fleas circumcising and fleas yes, and she's that's, like, that's, I don't know how that's you can do it thank you Rick that's going <laughs> to plague me in my dreams <laughs> <laughs> no problem. That's yeah. why I'm here, you know, yeah, yeah. painting pictures, you know. You're good at that. Um, All right. But no, this is, this is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. And, and, and as someone with a background, you know, outside of film, you know, I've spent 20 years working with domestic and sexual violence survivors and, and victims. And so this, yeah. is, this is something that, that's so you a get poignancy. This. Oh, yeah. 
you yeah, get this. Absolutely. This is and, great. And, that, and that's what I was talking about with the writing perspective. I've written several screenplays that involve those kinds of things, and I know when I'm writing them, I'm utterly disgusted writing the screenplay. Thinking about, I haven't filmed them yet, but right. thinking about filming them and, and, and how to do it in such a way where, especially in the abuse situation from the, the victim's standpoint, the sufferer's standpoint, when you're the director, getting, you, there's gotta be an imparting of, of a certain degree of, I don't know what to des- how to describe it, but something to that person who's going to be suffering the abuse to say, I understand that you know, this is gonna be highly emotional, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how do you? I tell my actor that I trust them. I empower them. Excellent. Y management, not X management. Yeah. yeah. So you're an actor's director. I, tr- I hope to be. I try to be. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that before about myself. Ah, and she's back. What? Me holding the microphone up here? I love teasing her. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to have to, at this moment, I'm I'm going to have to step off. I'd be happy to join you again. Okay. A couple of minutes. I've got a couple of preliminaries I've got to see to. Go to it. Thank you for having us tonight. You, you absolutely. Me, Thank you for being director here. Director of Spin the Plate along with a whole host of other activities in his uh, repertoire. South Shore. I moved, okay. but um, I was living in Hollis. But you're a New Englander. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So tell us, um, first of all, I've heard wonderful things about the story oh, and, and, and the, the screenplay and the production. One of our, our specialists, um, who runs our specialist corner, Mark Resnick, played a, a oh, yes. pretty prominent role in the film. Yeah, <laughs> he was pretty despicable. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. It, it's a difficult role for him because he's such a kind and gentle soul to play he such a scum. He managed to make it two-dimensional, but barely two-dimensional. So overall, I mean, how did you find f- from being a novelist, because you've written more than one book, correct? I have written nonfiction books. So I've written books on animal care that have been published by Bowtie Press. But this was my first novel. Oh, excellent. And, and you've won awards, too. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, some of the awards were the Living Now Award. Um, there's an award for women's literature. There's an award for cross-genre fiction, um, romance, chiclet. So, um, and these were indie book uh, awards. Excellent. Congratulations for all of that. That's <laughs> wonderful. I mean, so from translating the book into the screenplay, your husband did that. And were you over his shoulder the whole time? or? So that's actually an interesting story. So... The way that the book came about was just sort of an inspiration. It was almost as if I had seen a movie and I wrote down what I had seen. And it kind of hit me just in the daytime. It was like a daydream almost. Um, and that was Spin the Plate Short Story, which is a short, a short version that's available. And people were telling me this would make a great novel. And I had never written a novel before, so I got a lot of help. It's a lot of, it's a challenge. It is, it is. So my husband's a playwright. Mm -hmm. So he helped me with dialogue and with plot. So he did already help with the book, so he was very familiar with the book. And um, I also had different individuals help me write it. For example, there is a scene in the movie where there's a not very nice pimp and a teen prostitute. Mm -hmm. And um, Jo kind of takes matters into her own hand. And the way that that scene came about was a friend of mine who was reviewing the book said to me, you keep saying that this character is very violent. And she's always on the edge, but she never actually beats anybody up. So more violence in the movie. So so you had to add the violence to appease your friend? No, I actually said, write it. So she wrote the scene. And I hope, hopefully, she will be here tonight. And she is the most mild manner, kindest person. And, and who is this we're talking about? This is Libby Hanna. She lives in Brighton, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. So, when you were, you know, when you finished the novel and it was all going off to be published, who, who's the publisher, by the way? Um, the original publisher was Black Rose Writing. And then I decided that I really wanted this to be accessible to anyone who wanted to read it. I did not want cost to be a barrier. So after my contract was up with them, they wanted to renew, and I said, no, thank you, I'm going to self-publish. So right now, um, Amazon, is um, the Kindle is available free. It's available on iTunes. It's available on uh, Barnes & Noble. So, <laughs> so anybody that can read this can read it. I really feel like this story was a gift to me. And I feel can, like can you tell a little bit about the story or some of the inspiration behind the story? Not, not, you don't want to give away everything, obviously, because you want people to see the film but, right, right. Or, and read the book, obviously. Right, right. And one of the differences between the book and the movie is that the characters are, some characters are more developed and sometimes 
multiple characters are compressed into one because you have to yep. do things quicker, which my husband Tom was very good at, at doing that and developing characters real quick with a minimal dialogue. So one of the characters that was more developed in the movie is um, young Joe, and uh, this is a story about familial um, uh, sexual abuse. And the uh, main character is very tough, very strong. She's not afraid of anyone, but she has reoccurring um, uh, sort of daydreams about the abuse that happened to her, and she can't daymares. get away from that. Yes, daymares. <laughs> so she's got obviously suffers from like PTSD kind of thing. Yes, yes, and um, she basically has just cut herself off from the human race as protection. Mm -hmm. But her outlet for actually being a very compassionate person is animal rescue. And she also has a soft spot for children, especially young girls that are in similar situations. And uh, so a man named Francis comes along, who's a mysterious character. So I'm not going to tell you too much about him. Okay. And when people watch the first, the first several minutes of the movie or the trailer, the question is, who is this guy? So I'll just leave you with that question. Excellent. So a nice little mystery wrapped in an enigma. Yes. That's beautiful. So it's, okay. So now we're now we're into the into the uh, production or the pre-production phase. Yes. Screenwriting, you know, the script is done, your husband wrote it, and, and you, I'm assuming, helped a little bit with that development, saying, you know, maybe we should combine characters or, and things like that. You offered that insight? Um, he really wrote the screenplay, so occasionally I would, you know, try to use my influence to change things a little bit, but it was really, really good. He did, he did a really good job. Um, so then now we're on into production, and you're, you filmed it all in the New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire, northern Mass area, correct? Yep, a lot of it is Boston, and it's supposed to take place in Boston. So even the scenes that are in Nashua, like um, Nashua Public Transit, was nice enough to let us drive a bus around. Oh, it's, really? It That's looks awesome. like it's in Boston, and we put signs up to make it seem like Boston. I love when that happens. When, when, when communities come together and offer things that, that you never would have imagined. I mean, when I'm on it, just to, as an anecdote connection, um, my second film, uh, The Town of Milford, was very, very generous with some of their emergency services equipment and shutting down roads for us and let us into town hall. I mean, it was, it was just amazing how the response that happens, when, especially in New Hampshire, when you go, I'm making a movie, and they go, oh my God, come on in. Whereas like, I've heard things in, in other parts of the country where movies are so prevalent that it's more, you want to make a movie, how much? Pay me. So this is a no-budget film, really. Yeah. It's a micro-budget. The budget is so tight. And that makes it so much more beautiful. And, and, you know, yeah. that it, when you see it, you will think it's a Hollywood movie um, because of how it's almost a stone soup of movies. It's of indie films. So many people came together. And even in Boston, people were very generous. So um, the law, the, the, um, the Boston School of Law and, the, um, and a huge law office that like overlooks Boston and the bridge mm -hmm. um, donated their facility for us to film in. Nice. And part of it is because of this um, very under-talked about um, topic of familial abuse, you know, 10 million people in the United States alone are victims of this, but it's something that we don't talk about, we don't want to talk about. And the fact that this is fiction, I think, helps people to talk about it, because it's not a real person. And, and that leads me to this. I mean, I, I've spent the better part of 20 plus years working in various capacities with victims and survivors as a dispatcher and a journalist. What do you hope that this movie does, and the, and the book itself, what it, that it does for people who are suffering or people who aren't suffering, so to speak, but know people who are and things like that. I mean, is, it, is, it, is there a, an, a um, help that you want to uh, provide by telling the story? Right. Well, I didn't write this story with an agenda. As I said, it sort of yeah. came to me and I, I passed it and along. That's how the best stories come. Right. So, cool. But after writing it, what I really am hoping, I feel that familial abuse, sexual abuse is kind of the last safe haven for pedophiles. Mm -hmm. And we've addressed the, um, the priest sexual abuse, and who would have thought we ever could? And now, I mean, most people that are doing this, they're you know, bringing in good incomes, they're paying taxes. Imagine having to put these people in jail. I think we're sort of afraid as a society to talk about it or to prosecute it, but I think the time is right, and that's my hope. Excellent. I love that. So, okay, now we're now we're into production. You, you're getting all this wonderful communal communal involvement. As as I like to describe making a movie, it's everybody's adding their paintbrush to a cinematic mural. So all of that's going on. How did you find the translation from the novel to the actual people taking on these characters that you created? 
Was it was it something that was awkward to you at all, or was it? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, Eric Eastman was very true to the script. I mean, he definitely um, added his own um, flavor and his own skill to the movie. But I think he was he he really wanted to bring the characters from the novel to life. I think sometimes directors kind of want to write a different story or create different characters. And some of the characters, because in a movie you can't have so many characters, were combined. So, for example, um, we have this character of Charles Davis, and um, in the in the book he's kind of a jerk. He's kind of, in the in the movie he's more like um, Francis's right hand man. So some things were changed, and for me it was it was kind of interesting. It was like, oh, you know, it's you kind of get to see it almost from um, a fresh perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like looking at a painting that you painted and go, this is what I saw when I painted it, and someone else goes, well, I see something different, right, and, right. but yet... It's yeah, all yeah, to see it through someone else's eyes, and just to see the characters, like, walk off, like to see Becky, um, Becky Dennis and to see um, right. Dan Merriman as the character is so exciting. Now, they're coming tonight, correct? Um, I, saw, I saw Becky walk by. Oh, excellent, so we, so we have to grab her. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Donna, and congratulations. I can't wait to see everything, and, and we appreciate you having us here. And we are back on the reddish-brown carpet here at Junkies in Nashua, Indie Rising, Rick Dumont, and with the star of Spin the Plate, Becky Dennis. Becky, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so this. much, Rick, for having us we, and interviewing. Uh, are you kidding? Thank you for letting us come and, and take over a little bit here for a non-hostile takeover and do some yeah. recording and talking to you folks before everything goes crazy yeah. with this. This is exciting. So, I mean, where to start? How, what, what, drew, what drew you to the film? Um, well, initially, um, Eric Eastman, who is the director who I had worked with before, had approached me about the role. And um, I read the book and really was drawn to the character. Um, and I had a chance to, I think I prepared like seven different scenes for the callback. Um, so I really, I didn't get to read the whole script initially, but I really liked what I was reading from the pieces of the script. And yeah, they never let you see the whole yeah. script, do they? <laughs> right, right. And luckily, um, you know, when I was offered the role, I accepted before reading the script. And luckily, I, when I read the whole film script, I liked that as well. So, Which, which helps, But yes. um, the character is, uh, it's a really complex character that as an actor, it's, you can really sink your teeth into a very meaty role that goes on a journey and very complex. So, yeah. <laughs> now, how was that for you to, to have to internalize? I mean, Donna and Eric both told us a little bit about some of the some of the things that, that the character goes through or had gone through but how how do you internalize all that and then bring that forth as an actor yeah um well it it wasn't easy at first to at first i wasn't sure if i was like completely right for the role and i was kind of second guessing myself but um as time went on i really um got to know the character and felt like i um could fully immerse in it so um and I was able to eventually connect with the character and relate parts of my past that maybe I had closed off before to uh, to bring out. <laughs> so there's a little bit of catharsis yeah. involved in, in playing such a role? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily go through what Joe went through with, uh, luckily, you know, I haven't Thankfully. been through, you know, that. But um, she suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I found that I, I do kind of have a little bit of that from um, the past, just like, uh, you know, nightmares or things from, not from being abused, but from different things that have happened. Yeah, I think, so. I think a lot, I mean, like, like Eric and I were talking, <laughs> yeah. everybody does have a certain degree of baggage that they carry yeah. with them, and it really involves in how much you're dealing with, and obviously, you know, the character was dealing with a lot more than, than anybody should ever have to deal with. Yes, but absolutely, um, so... so what do you, I mean, I, we, we talked a little bit with Donna about messages with what she hopes to gain from this film. And, you know, obviously it didn't start as, a, as a, just an inspiration to create a story, but do you hope this, that this like, has any sort of effect on society at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we hope that the film can uh, bring about awareness to uh, problems that aren't um, usually you know, talked about in films like, um, you know, incest and, um, you know, abuse, domestic violence, um, animal cruelty, lots of different things going on. Um, so hopefully it will inspire people to um, 
bring awareness and change and inspire people to so, move, move to um, at, at least be aware and possibly change things. So, it's a very, very, very powerful film. A lot of very hard to deal with subject matters that that our society doesn't necessarily like to talk about. But yeah. you, but you all just pulled the wool right off of everything and said. We're going to show it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to deal with it. Everybody has to. Yeah, but we we try to also do it in a way that's entertaining and not just shoving subjects down your throat. Which like, is good. yeah, so, it's so not, you're not preaching necessarily. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's there's entertainment. There's Hidden comedic moments. Teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. There's comedic moments too, and mm. there's uh, positive, happy endings, and well, hopefully know, that's not giving away too much. Well, one of, one of the things that I found as a journalist when I was doing a lot of the, the stories that I was covering on, on survivors and, and victims um, was that after the stories came to, into print, tons of people, like the call volume to police departments and agencies mm -hmm. went sky high. Yeah. Do you think a film ha can have that same kind of helpful effect? I think so, and I, I think Donna's already experienced that with the book, that she didn't realize the impact that writing this book would have on uh, people who have had similar experiences and um, how it's helped them. <laughs> and um, so hopefully the movie can even do that to a wider audience. So we're here with, with the very lovely and unbelievably talented Tajora Davis, a.k.a. TJ. <laughs> Long time no see. Yeah. Um, and you're in Spin the Plate. I am. What did you do? I got to play the role of a tattoo parlor owner. It was fantastic, actually. Um, now, do you have ink? Excuse me, do I have I, You know, I'm going to confess, I do not have ink. Um, very Classic oh. tattoo parlor owner. Yeah, I know. Oh. Exactly. Well, she's, she's more of a businesswoman. I kind of justified it as her being someone who really just focused on getting the business and running it right and make sure she picked the right artistic people to be there. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So that was that was your thing yes. in the film. Now, how did you find this whole story overall and oh, the people and everything? Was, I thought the story was fantastic, honestly. Um, anything that, that, that advocates for, for people who have been abused or uh, in a situation where they really just need to, 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 to get their head straight and, and get the help that they need, it's, it's fantastic, honestly. Yeah. And so how's life otherwise? What else you got going on? Oh, um, well, Singing career. <laughs> I know I've got my cover band, just the normal stuff, acoustic yeah. duos. Um, I have an art project that's coming up in New York. So what kind of art project? Um, I had a sculpture on the fountain at the Cathedral of St. John Divine. Nice. Um, and nice. thank you. Hurricane Sandy actually destroyed the sculpture and it was supposed to be on permanent. <laughs> I know it was supposed to be on permanent display. So mm -hmm. they recently asked me to come and recreate the statue. Awesome. So. I've got to do some sculpting sometime in the next two months. Um, That's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a while, but I'm excited. <laughs> Congratulations, TJ. That's Thank you. Fantastic. It's so great to see great you. Great to see you as well. Oh, love you, lady. <laughs> love you too. And enjoy the party. I will. Hello, hello, sir. Hi, how are you? Very Tom good, Anastasi. Tom. Nice to see you Hi. face to face finally, yes. sir. Yes. <laughs> the screenwriter, Tom Anastasi. And producer. And producer. Yes. Of course, we can't forget producer because you know, yeah. but it's the screenwriting that everybody wants to know about. Oh, is it really? The okay. Well, the production is is the nuts and bolts that people can tend to go. Yeah, so you put it all together and you got all these people and you hired them all and you brought them yeah, all yeah, in and, yeah, yeah. and but there's no glamour in producing, but there's a little bit of glamour in screenwriting. That's why yeah. nobody wants to be a producer. <laughs> no. It's it's yeah. you write you write the screenplay, Matthew you have Broderick, to produce it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Matthew Broderick was wrong. Nobody wants to be a producer. <laughs> <laughs> was that Mel Brooks? Yes. <laughs> So you wrote you wrote this uh, after well, your after your book. right wife wrote the book. Yes, you took it and said, "Honey, we need to make a movie." Yes, that was it. Um, we had actually saw a movie called Once, and uh, which was made on no budget whatsoever. And I said to her, about two and a half years ago, I said, "You know, if I ever made a movie, I would want to make a movie like that." So this is your first. Yes, I've done some training videos and things like that, mm -hmm. but this is my first feature film. I've produced a lot of plays. Yeah. I've had nine plays produced, and I've produced a lot of plays, and a lot of it's the same, except it's more complicated because for a play, you're in one place all the time. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to 15 different places, yeah. and you're, you have to score buildings and vehicles. Yeah. and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so it was wonderful, and this was actually our 25th anniversary present to each other. Awesome. We just had our 25th anniversary oh, about two weeks ago. Well, thank you. So this is well it. Done. And it was it was fun and to see it come alive is is pretty incredible. Now, as as a person who's been involved in theater for a very long time, and, yeah, and, and a, obviously a bit of a student of film, yes, having watched movies, correct? yes, was it fascinating from the? How did you feel like you know as it was all coming together? You're watching the actors. Obviously, did Eric? Did you ever hear any casting at all, or was it all? 
Eric. Oh gosh, no, uh, Eric and I, we did that together. Everything has been very collaborative with Eric and I right from the start. Right. And we were completely collaborative on every single casting decision. And it, we had so many good people. And one of the toughest things when you do a play or a movie is that you've got to uh, you know, tell some really good people no. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, somebody is trying to get a hold of me. <laughs> and you've got to tell them no. As it happens on semi-live TV, which is not really live TV, but that's OK. And you are? Join us. Sorry about that because uh, my phone number is the phone number people use. To of course. Call well, Evelyn is here. She just yeah, popped in Evelyn. into the. She is a terrific actress. And what's amazing is is that the uh, the she plays one of the aunts, mm -hmm. and the other aunt, uh, and you had just became fast friends and unbelievable uh, electric chemistry uh, in the movie. Awesome. Yeah. So how, and tell us about that. How did that happen, and how did you come across Tom and this whole group? Well, I think Tom come, came across me. I, I was very fortunate to be picked out of a, you know, a crowd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's magic. Uh, yes, he yes. is absolutely magic, and he's absolutely right about the other Auntie Zeely. We spent some time getting to know each other before we actually started the filming, and, and it really helped, and mm -hmm. we did connect, and... I think the energy was the same, and we knew that um, that our part was was integral, and the importance of us connecting, you know, meant that we could bring our scenes out in a manner that had some a little bit of comic relief, and it was so natural for us to be that way. So we really enjoyed it. We had a really good time doing it, and, and, and she encapsulated the character very well. She did, and one of the things is is that their scenes, many of them, were not in the book. So we added them for the movie. Um, because in a book, you've got pages and pages to explain something. So one of the decisions you have to make as a screenwriter is you don't want to spin the plate the miniseries. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very judicious in what you don't use. And then we also added things so people wouldn't just say, oh, I've read the book. Why well, see the movie? Right. So there's a lot of scenes that got added. And some of the scenes added, added or have a comic touch because it gets you, you can only do kind of some of the heavier parts for so long. Sure. So oh, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. Once you go into that dark place, you have to come out of yeah, it with, yeah, yeah. with some humor. Right. And what was wonderful is that Tom and Eric were so fantastic in giving us some liberty to do a little bit of ad-libbing mm -hmm. and a little improv to add to the, um, the scene, to, to what was happening, if something felt right even though it might not have been in the script itself, and we went with it and it worked, they, awesome. they, they beautiful when that took happens. it in memory. And, and yeah, you, and get the, was, you get a director yeah. like that who allows oh, that is beautiful. Goodness. So for, for those who, I'm sorry, I, no, I no. cut you off. No, no. But uh, for those of who out there who don't necessarily know who you are, can you give us a little bit of background on, on where you've been, what you've been doing, well, and I, where you're going? <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> but I hope it's somewhere good. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I started in film, oh, maybe about 20 years ago, just doing some extra work, working with uh, Jay Craven, Kingdom County Productions, and uh, in between, I was working and raising a family and being a state legislator for the state of New Hampshire. Is that how you met Eric? Uh, no, actually. So you're a state legislature, sled legislator in New Hampshire? I was, and I was a, a legislator before Eric became one, and it was kind of nice because we connected at that level also, sure. and, uh, and that was really kind of interesting and, and challenging in a way because we kept that separate, but yet there was a tie-in. You know, when you're a legislator, you have to perform in a way, in a natural, real, honest, authentic way. Unlike those ones, those guys that uh, thwarted those poor little kids that wanted to name the bird. Oh, I am... <laughs> not to bring up politics, no, but... but... I am really glad that I was not in the legislature at that time. I think I would have done a little bit of screaming. That, that's pretty. That's pretty embarrassing. I I'll mean, say, it, but right, but I'll, but I'll back to back to you as an actor. I'll save my screaming for the seat. The, the, the screen. Go. My screaming for the screen. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've been in a number of films, and you're from obviously New Hampshire. Any anything that other than spin the plate that we would know, the audience might know. Um, possibly, uh, Stranger in the Kingdom, di uh, Northern Borders, Disappearances. They are, are they were not necessarily big blockbuster films. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those people who appreciate indie films, absolutely. or what what is technically called indie indie films these days, exactly. those are the ones you've been doing. That's fantastic. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Dan Merriman joins us on, on in front of the uh, banner for your film. You were one of the primary characters in this movie, correct? Yes, I'm um, the co-star playing Francis. Yeah. And, and so what does Francis do in this movie? Is he a good guy, bad guy? He's mysterious, um, but he's a good guy. Excellent. Yeah, they didn't want to tell us too much about Francis, so I was trying to get it out of you. Like, <laughs> what do you do in this movie? Uh, you know, I dodge questions from people inquiring about what I do in this movie. Excellent. And you're from, you're from where? I'm from uh, here, actually, Litchfield, New Hampshire. Oh, but, excellent. Uh, yeah, I went to school in Nashua, which is this town right here. So. Oh, Chunky's. Nice place. Yeah, yeah. And a good place for a premiere party, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Good food, good screens. Good people, good, good times. I was getting there. I was getting to that good people. <laughs> I'm, I'm helping. I'm assisting yes, in that process. Yes, yes. So, exactly. so as an actor, the how, how first feature film, mul multiple feature films, what's your, what's your background? I, I've done some other uh, B-rated films and whatnot, um, and I've had roles in uh, independent films and student films and all this stuff. This is my first full-length serious film with a serious role, I think. And what do you, what do you take from what do you take from this as as the you know, the subject matter of the movie and and being one of your first more lengthy productions? Well, it's based on uh, the book by uh, Don Anastasi, and then the screenplay is written by Tom Anastasi, and it's a great book with. Uh, um, it's based on. Now, did you guys all have to read the book? Is that like a mandatory thing? It wasn't mandatory. But it, you know, it was it was uh, recommended. Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> well, you want you want to read the book. Please. Absolutely, and the script is different than the book in a few ways. So you know, you you can do. So we've been other. told, but not fully. <laughs> oh, you have to you have to see it. Absolutely. You have to wait and see it. Well, we appreciate it, Dan. Thanks for stopping by, and no, no congratulations and all that good stuff. And good well, luck. thank you. And we'll be talking. Excellent. Dan Merriman, everybody, and we got one more person coming over here before the party yeah. really gets rolling. Right on. Hello, Paul. Hi. Good to meet you. Hi. Good Rick to meet Dumont. You. We're here. You're here on Indie Rising, which, yeah. in case nobody told you, this is the. Uh, never mind. He's, he's the what? He's, the he's what? He, you know, he's uh, he's another main character in the movie. Shh, don't give it away. So you're the you're the cop that beats Mark Resnick to death, right? No, no, I'm not. Interesting. Okay. I, no. So what do you <laughs> what do you play? I, I play Charles Davis, and uh, I am the. Uh, financial tycoon in the story. Okay. And how does that fit into the plot that I have heard? I've heard a lot, but a little about this movie, so I don't, I, I don't see much. where this financial genius uh, and multimillionaire comes into play. Yeah. It's, I don't know how much I'm supposed to give away. Probably so. nothing. Probably nothing, so <laughs> let's just say... So we, we won't, we, we'll I'm, edit this out, so just let us know. I'm a, Kidding. Uh, a billionaire... And I have a private jet, mm -hmm. and I uh, am a very um, generous person who works well with charities. And uh, so that's you're probably a, so all you're I'm a good guy, in theory, uh, uh, on the surface. Yeah. Okay. I'm a good. Yeah. All right. So all right. So I'm so, a good guy. I'm not how, a bad how, guy. Let me ask you this I then. I may not be what I seem. I'll, let me, how, how do you how do you get yourself into a character like that? I mean, you're 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 a long time actor. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming I guess you've I've been doing it for a while. A um, how do I get myself into a character like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, because I mean, you don't. I haven't met you before. I'm and you know, my business, my partner Angela knows you. She she thinks yeah. you're a great guy. So you have to have something on the ball in that regard. But if you're playing a, a person with uh, a dark side that might come out a little bit more yeah, than, no, no, than he not should. No, no, really a dark side. He's just not what he, he isn't what he seems without me really. So you're not really a billionaire. Things. Well. <laughs> you put it all in plastic. I understand. Yeah, um, it works. Yeah. It so works for everybody in America. We don't want to give away the plot, but um, I'm not what I seem, but I am a good guy. Uh, and so, so I am, I am into, friends you, of the main character. How do you get into these roles? You mean like how do I get myself into yeah, that as, character as a performer? Yes. Cast? Well, both. Um, we'll go with how you get into it first. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I, I always approach acting as kind of, uh, with kind of a, a real approach. Like, what would this guy do? Um, I'll do research if I need to to get into a role. Um, if I have any personal experience on certain people, certain types of people in their character traits, I pick that up. And you know, one of the things that I think makes a good actor a good actor is that 
he observes people and I'm constantly doing that. I'm, I, you know, I'm always observing right. people. people you know, watching is one they're... of the most fun things. Yeah. So, so whether you know somebody's pompous or he's clumsy or whatever it is, you know, you notice that stuff. And then when you get a certain role, there are clues within the script on how this guy should be played. At least that's the way I. That's the way I approach Absolutely. it. So I, I look at this thing. I see what the role is and what he's supposed to be doing, and I try to think of people that are like that. You know, like I didn't really envision anybody. Um, you know, maybe somebody like Alec Baldwin, like somebody who just kind of looked, because he's kind of like a big guy and, you know, graying hair. And so it's I an kinda, interesting concept, I comparison. At, like, you know, how would he uh, deliver a speech or something? So that, but I didn't really like emulate anybody. Um, you know, definitely not Donald Trump. <laughs> but, but well, you I, definitely don't have the hair for Donald you know, Trump, like, well, so no. unless they stuck a wig on your head or uh, a dead rat or yeah. something. No, my, my hair is bad enough as Sorry, it is. Donald. You can um, keep paying me. So, yeah, so that's that. And, and then as far as how did I get cast, um, it was either Tom or Eric, you know, were looking to fill this role and, and thought of me and thought that I might be the right guy for it. And uh, awesome. Congratulations you know, on that. We you. very much appreciate you being here, sir. Okay, I appreciate We will it. let you get back to the festivities. Thank you. So enjoy, and congratulations on the film. We can't wait to see the whole thing. Trailer tonight, whole thing later. So. Can't wait. Thank <laughs> Take you. care. Enjoy. Hey, let's do a pickup. A pickup? What do we got to pick up? We're going to pick up on um, what, what, I, what I got out of this. Ah, yes, very good. Yes. We never answered that question, did we? No, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, well, we should answer that question. I think we should. We're back you, guys. with Mr. Merriman. He's finished making merry for a couple minutes. He's going to bring it over here. Man. <laughs> So yeah, tell us, dude. We, we didn't get the answer to the question of what you got out of all this. Well, one of the biggest things I got out of this whole experience was <laughs> seeing just exactly how talented and alive and vibrant the filmmaking community is here. Just the uh, the support we received from other projects, um, you know, working with people that were working on other projects, that came from other projects, that went to work on other projects, and just the immense amount of talent and creativity right here in New England. There is a lot of passion here. It is astounding. I mean, hey, you know, they're calling it Hollywood East for a reason, I suppose. And that's why we have the show that we have to cover people like Dan and everybody, everybody involved in this project and other projects that you've seen is to showcase just how talented everybody is in this community and, and, and what they're trying to do to elevate their game and, and bring entertainment home to you or to theaters for you or concert stages for you, bookshelves, you name it, art galleries. It's all about you people out there. And, and that's what he does, that's what I do, that's what everybody here in this room does. It's all about, so, telling, all about telling the story and entertaining and getting messages out and having fun. All the things that we look to entertainment for. Exactly. And it's, you know, a lot of hard work. And this is a good one, too. It's a good pertinent message about, you know. Absolutely. Very important. Yeah, absolutely. About how you can't do it alone. Yeah. You need help. And Somebody you, said once it takes a village. Yeah, exactly. And if you can, yeah, reach out there, you know, you may be surprised that, you know. How many other arms are out there? I mean, exactly. I, and, and I know, I know that from. You up and give you a hand. Exactly. And I, and I kind of got that with my first film, which was. Uh, more kind of based on bipolar disorder, manic mm. depression. And, and during the production phase of it, I found every person I talked to either knew somebody or was somebody. It was very important to them to hear that I was making this movie about, about manic depression and, and how it affects people. And so I, I'm assuming similar kinds of things might have happened through the yeah. course of this production, talking to people, if you, how much was let out. You know, but I'm a, I'm a blabbermouth, so it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much yeah, exactly everything that happened with the book, um, you know, the people in the groups that it reached and whatnot. Yeah, um, yeah we had similar experiences with the movie. Fantastic. So, but you know, the movies reach a wider audience and possibly a different audience. Than oh, definitely a different audience. Yeah. So, stick you on camera. Absolutely. I'm all, I'm all for it, man. All right, we're back again. This time with uh, Rich Bailey. He's an actor. He's a producer. Yes, He's actor, producer, teacher. I mean, stuff, God, man. you do it all, man. <laughs> you're you're not now you're not in the spin the plate but you're here for a supportive but a different reason as well tell us about that yeah well 
primarily I'm here to support a lot of people that I'm crazy about that, that worked on this. Including Mark, I know. Including Mark, who's a very dear friend of mine, absolutely. But um, we were also uh, lucky enough that they uh, are showing uh, the trailer for a film that I wrote or co-wrote with my dear friend Kim Wilson. Um, and what's the title of that? Uh, that film is called Cleave. Cleave, yeah. Right. It's, uh, so I've heard about Cleave. I've been hearing about it for a while. I need to see that, so I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm glad you're hearing about it. That means the promotion. So that's another one to pay attention to, people. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I wrote it and co-wrote it with Kim Wilson. Uh, it was directed uh, by Kate Carson, produced by Justin Plass. Yeah, Kate's uh, awesome. And I've worked on several projects with her. We've developed a great relationship, and so she'll be here later tonight. Hopefully you can speak to her as well. But we're psyched to see it uh, up on the big screen here and, and, and watch the trailer for it and, and give everybody that has that a chance to check out the trailer. Uh, and we wish you well with Cleve. And when that becomes more of a revolution here, we'll have to you know, get you on and talk more fully about it. But this is about Spin the Plate tonight, Absolutely. obviously. But it is about, I mean, we could also say that, you know, Sweaty Turtle has a trailer going on tonight too. But oh, really? yeah, the short film that where Mark played the uh, shrink okay. who falls asleep called About Him. So we we got the trailer for that into this. So it's this is cool, like seeing a whole bunch of trailers for local Absolutely. filmmakers, right? It's a great idea. It's, it's like a short film festival, but a really micro short film festival. Yeah, but I think it's a but good it idea. Is all man. This. I mean, yeah. I can't wait to see the whole so thing. Many people involved in it that that are just awesome. Yes. Meaning, you know, Mark, Raja, Becky. Yeah, I mean, Eric. Yeah, I mean, all great people that I'm so happy to be here to support. And that just goes to show you out there, the viewers, the talent pool in New England is so deep and and we get to work together on, on a variety of projects and, and it's just amazing the quality that's coming up absolutely well look film is a collaborative game right and if you if you can't uh can't find a good team you ain't gonna cut it so so we got to do we'll get to the party man we'll see you inside thanks rich appreciate it, you got it. take care <laughs> so we are here with um Mark Resnick, as you all know him as the specialist on, on the specialist corner of the you show. Know me? Who are you? <laughs> I don't know who I am. At, 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 at this Red. party, and, and this is his lovely bride, Nikki. Hello, my um, lovely bride. I'm blessed to have on my arm tonight. She's looking beautiful. Thank you. It, it, that Thank she you. is. How are you, buddy? Very, very good. Good, Mark. good, Thank good. You. Thank you for uh, stopping by the little. Our, our cameras and paying attention to our little show. That's how we roll, man. I'm excited. Uh, Mark, so you are the. He's the guy that plays. The sick individual. Who me? That in this in this film, spin the plate. Only, I only play it in the films, guys, and behind closed doors at home. But that's that's it. Well, that, you know, nobody knows what goes right, behind behind doors. Right. But I'll tell you, it, to to know this guy, the guy's got a heart bigger than you know half of this building. Really, really superhuman being. But to play a character as vile as you had described him to me, and now after talking with Eric and Donna about it, how did you get there? Um, very, very good question. It was a very, very tough character to explore. Um, I used some good, good friends and acting teachers to kind of help me achieve uh, what I was looking for. And that was, uh, first thing, you need to find something to love in this character, despite how um, abhorrent his behavior is. So I really, I respected the fact that he was a father. Despite everything, he's a loving father, um, nurturing. Um, but sick has a very very bad problem which isn't really you know explored too too much on film internally it was um, so that's I mean that's essentially how I did it I didn't want to come across as that um, sort of quintessential creepy you know yeah, they, 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 I just wanted to be a dad who's got a, who's sick who has a problem and um, hopefully hopefully that came off well, cer certainly from uh, Donna and Eric's perspective, you nailed it. I mean, Eric, Eric couldn't stop talking about how wonderful a performer you are and, and obviously easily directed, but not really needing to be directed. I mean, is that, is that kind of how you roll? Well, Eric, um, another good brother of mine, um, this was his first feature directing, and he did give us the license and the latitude to explore each beat and each scene. And... Um, he did, a, he did a great job. You know, he reeled me in when he needed to and um, just sort of let, 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 it, let us go. And I think, you know, it was really a collaborative process to create um, the energy and um, what we needed to for this particular story, which was, you know, clearly it was a little funky, but I think we yeah. pulled it off. That's excellent. Nikki, what did you, how about your husband playing uh, a very dark individual? Well, 
I know him for a long time. He has his dark moments, but it's really, I mean, it, just the, the absolute difference between the personality of Mark Resnick, who I know and love a long time, and this character, as Mark said, who's extremely, extremely disturbed. Um, and he had to work really hard to get to that place. Was it, what, did you did you notice a change in him around the house during the sh during production? Was he was he brooding and? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to be real though, um, when when Eric yelled cut, it was um, it was rough. I had to I had to shake it off. It was it was very it was very hard, and Eric appreciated that. He saw that. Um, with me coming out of it and had a always had a hug waiting for me as, as you that's know, as awesome left the scene it was it was cool it was a great experience hi donna how are you i love this all right <laughs> this is, i know you i know you do brother let me thanks give you a for hug being here, thanks for having us man. my pleasure guys we'll see, you see him next time on indie rising on indie rising specialist corner, and the specialist corner. Don't miss it. all right all right well we are wrapping up here at, at chunky's we're going to go in and join the party and this is Rick Dumont from Indie Rising signing off. Congratulations to the Spin, spin the Plate crew, including Eric Eastman over there hiding off camera. He's, it looks like he's going to jump out of an airplane. And look at his cheeks. He's falling. He's falling. There we go. Thank you very much, folks. We'll see you next time on Indie Rising.